Right, okay guys, um, we'll start, um, but I'll start with a recap while other people are coming in. My apologies, I've just dashed from a tutorial, so I'm already a bit dry, so I'll try to keep drinking and hopefully you can hear me as I talk. So, firstly, Gordon sends his apologies, he's away in India this week, so unfortunately you've got me instead so I apologize for that I will try and do my best um, to uh, to fill his shoes he sent me some information on where he was up to and what work you'd done with him the week before last did you do particulate last week and then the week before that you did gas phase chemistry, was that right? So I believe, tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe in the last lecture you looked at photochemistry and you got about as far as the previous slide. So sort of this thing. Did you finish here? These things? Yeah? I can see some nods. So we'll just recap. Oops. Where am I? Here. So we'll just do a recap before we start the next lecture. So I think Gordon talked talk to you about photolysis. That's this thing, in, this equation here in the, in the top right hand corner. Okay. Photolysis is the rate at which you can break down a molecule chemically by interaction with radiation. So if we have sunlight hitting a molecule and it's got enough energy, then that molecule will fall apart into different components. And that's called photolysis. Okay? To understand the rate at which photolysis happens, we have to think about three different things. Okay? We have to think about the amount of light that's hitting that molecule. So how much radiation is hitting that molecule? And that's shown in the top left. Okay? So if you can imagine a molecule sat at the point right in the middle of that cone, okay, it's going to receive radiation from the whole sphere that surrounds it. And we have to integrate across every direction this way, every direction this way, and then across each solid angle. So that, the photolysis there, is given by I lambda d lambda, okay? It's the incident radiation at that point, so at a given wavelength. And we're going to integrate it over all space. Once that radiation has hit the molecule, it can do a number of things. It can scatter, just interact with the molecule but then scatter away. Well then the molecule stays just the same as it was before. So nothing's happened. Or it could be absorbed. And that's this thing. Okay? This shows the absorption cross section. 
so it shows how light of different wavelengths, in this case the example is, is, is the ozone spectrum, the ozone absorption cross-section, from around about 250 nanometers deep in the UV through to 800 nanometers right out in the infrared. Okay? This range covers the range of radiation coming into the top of the, to the, uh, top of the atmosphere from the sun. Okay. Below about 380 nanometers, there's a very strong absorption by the, in the Hartley band, and we'll come back to that later. And then the Huggins band down here, which have got quite a lot of structure in them. From 380 nanometers all the way through the visible, there's a much weaker Shackley band. So ozone does absorb but it's much, much more weak. And it's about a thousand times less efficient absorption in the visible than in the UV. This is a long scale. And there are some even weaker bands out in the infrared. Okay? So this shows us how light of a given wavelength is absorbed by a molecule, how efficiently that process happens, okay, compared to scattering. And we can see it's very wavelength dependent. So the absorption cross-section is the sigma up there, okay. So then we have this last thing, okay. Now we've got our molecule, AB star. What does AB star mean? It means we've excited it. We've got a molecule AB, and we've excited that molecule. We've put some energy in. Okay? So we've had the energy incident on the molecule in the top left. The energy is absorbed by the molecule here. And then this tells us what happens once we've excited and put that energy into that molecule. And this is what's happening. So there's a whole bunch of different processes. We could have luminescence, where the particle goes back to the ground state and it emits a photon. It could be that we have quenching. So the energy that we've absorbed is lost again because it hits another molecule in the atmosphere. Probably nitrogen, because that's the most common molecule. Or it might be a oxygen. It hits that molecule, it gives up its energy to that molecule, and then it relaxes back to the ground state. It could be ionization. So we could have put enough energy in that we extract an outer shell electron and separate it from the molecule. So we ionize the molecule. And likely, the place we're going to do that is right at the top of the atmosphere, where we have the most energetic radiation. We could dissociate the molecule. So the two atoms that are in the molecule, A and B, we're giving them enough energy that we can separate them. Okay? And then they can go on and do other things. They can do, do, undertake different reactions. It could be the case that we can initiate a direct reaction. If the radiation hits at the same time as a third reactant appears alongside that molecule. We could isomerize the molecule. Isomerization means restructure the molecule. So we could change, we could use enough energy that it restructures itself into a different form. Typically, that happens for more complicated organic compounds, not for the simple compounds. But it can happen. We can transfer energy from one molecule to another. Or we can transfer the energy across a molecule. Again, those tend to happen where we've got big molecules. But all of these different things can happen. Now, for each of these processes, we have a thing called quantum yield. And what that's saying is, if we put a photon in there, into our molecule, and it's absorbed by the molecule, what are the chances of that process happening. 
one of those processes happen. So for each of these processes, there will be a quantum yield. Okay? A different quantum yield. If there's absolutely no chance of that happening at all, then the quantum yield is zero. If that process will happen every single time a photon is absorbed, the quantum yield is one. Okay? And obviously the quantum yield is going to change, so that's phi up there. The quantum yield will change as a function of the wave So if we now multiply all of these three things together, the incident light on the molecule, the absorption at a given wavelength, and the likelihood of the process happening, the quantum yield at a given wavelength, then we have the rate at which that process will occur at that given wavelength. Now we have to integrate over all wavelengths. And that's what we've got at the top. And if we multiply that by the number of molecules that we've got, that gives us the rate of change of those number of molecules as a function of time. So the Na by T is equal to the total number of molecules multiplied by the rate. And the rate is the integral of the intensity of radiation, the absorption cross-section, and the quantum yield at a given wavelength integrated over all wavelengths. You saw this last week, right? Good. You also saw this last week? Yeah? I'm not going to give you last week's lecture again, you're all right, but this is important that we understand what's going on here, because this is going to form the basis of the next several weeks of lectures. Okay? You looked at different orders of reaction. You looked at first order, and we've just seen an example of a first order reaction, where we have one molecule, and we do something to it, and it produces two molecules, or two atoms, or whatever. Okay? That's a unimolecular reaction, or a first order reaction. Okay? Because it only relies on one reactant. And in the case of photolysis, it requires a depends on one reactant and the amount of light. Yeah? A bimolecular reaction requires that molecule A and molecule B come together and react to form some products, C and D. Okay? That's a second order reaction. Because second order just means that if we double one reactant, we get twice the reaction. If we double both reactants, we get four times the Or, it could be the case that we have a termolecular reaction, a three-body reaction, okay? A plus B plus some third body. Now, that third body doesn't end up in the final molecule. But it needs to be there. Do we know why it needs to be there? We're good. Brilliant. We've got to get rid of that energy. Okay, so what's happening is those two, A and B, if they were to come together without M, they would create so, release so much energy that they break apart to A and B again. The only way we can make that process work is if we have a third body M to come in and carry off that energy. Okay? So for a process like this, a third order reaction, where we've got M coming in and taking off some energy. What do we know must be true? What's M likely to be, first of all? Most likely to be nitrogen. What's it next likely to be? Oxygen. So they're the two most abundant things in the atmosphere. Right? So the vast majority of the time, this third body reactant is going to be nitrogen or oxygen. And it doesn't play any other role in taking away this energy. 
Given that, given what you've just said, what do we that now know about this third body reaction? How will it, how will it, the rate of it change through the atmosphere as we go forwards? It's going to change a lot with pressure because the availability of air is really high down the ground and it's almost not there at all when we get to the mesosphere. So we've got a big pressure gradient that drives that reaction. They're also very temperature dependent, but we'll come to that in We also have, in gas phase kinetics, often big cycles. So one reactant will start a chain and lead to a big reaction chain and then some products. So, we have an initiation. Usually this is generating radicals, free radicals. And we'll come. Did you talk about radicals last week? The week before last? Yeah? Okay. So usually this is initi there's an initiation process. Often that's photolysis, most often. So that's when we generate these radicals. We then have some re reactions that change one radical into another radical. And we might even get that back again. So it's conversion between these. And that's propagation. Some reactions will let us get two radicals from one radical. Okay, so we get branching, and that allows us to multiply off the number of radicals we've got. Now, if that's all that went on, we'd end up with a big radical soup. The whole atmosphere would be full of this stuff, and it'd be massively reactive, and we couldn't live there. So we, the atmosphere then gets rid of these radicals by a set of what's called termination reactions. And typically these are a radical combined with another radical to give a stable product. Okay? And we'll look at an example of that this week when we come to think about stratospheric chemistry. I think the last thing Gordon did last week was talk about the pseudo steady state approximation, did he? Yeah? So we can do this very quickly. Um, we're forming very highly reactive intermediates. So in this case, we've got molecular oxygen, which we're going to photolyze. Okay? It photolyzes in the upper atmosphere, where we've got a lot of DUV, we've got a lot of energy, and we can break that double bonded oxygen molecule apart. And when we break it apart, typically we'll form one ground state oxygen, and one excited oxygen atom. A, a, tri a, a, a triplet P is the ground state, and a singlet D is the excited state. It's actually a forbidden transition, so it's hard for that excited oxygen to get back to ground state. And that means it hangs around for just long enough that it can react with things. It can do a couple of things. It can either collide into nitrogen or oxygen, our so-called air, and form ground state, a ground state oxygen atom. And that's pretty boring, because then it will recombine um, with something else and form you know, oxygen molecule. We'll look at that a bit later. That's called being quenched, because it's getting rid of that extra energy. Or, if it, react, if it finds an, an oxygen molecule, and it's got to do that in the presence of a third body, then it can form ozone. And that is great news for the purposes of oxidation chemistry because we've now propagated this formation. Now, the pseudo steady state. If we want to know what the formation rate of O singlet D is, the rate of formation is equal, or the rate of change of O singlet D is equal to R1, the rate of formation, minus the loss through reaction 2, where O singlet D reacted with a third, or collided with a third body to give us, um, to give us a, 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 a ground state oxygen. And we can solve that just using a standard integral. 
Now, if this thing is in steady state, what has to be true? The rate of change, do single d by dt is zero. Yeah? So R1 must equal K2 O single d times n. Yeah? So the steady state O single d concentration is equal to the reaction rate one divided by K2 divided by the concentration of n. If n is essentially the pressure. It's always in steady state if the time constant in that integral is much longer than 1 over K2n. Because that makes that exponential big. Right? Does that make sense? Essentially, we want something where the, ex ex the, the exponential of minus K2nt is bigger than zero, significantly bigger than zero. Under that circumstance, we're not in steady state because we've got decay. But if that exponential can be approximated to zero, then the solution to O single D equals all of that horrible standard integral is just R1 over k 2 So, as long as t is much bigger than 1 over k 2 n then we're in steady state. Now, up at 80 kilometers in the atmosphere, so way up at the top of the stratosphere, n is 10 to the 14 molecules per centimeter cube. k2 is 3 times 10 to the minus 11. So as long as t is greater than 3 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds, the photostationary state holds. If either of these two change over something less than, uh, or greater than 3 milliseconds, it changes in steady state. We can do a similar thing for the ground state oxygen. And that's here. I'm not going to go through that now because we're going to do quite a lot of these today. Okay? But you get the idea. We're dealing with fast reactants. We're going to end up with an exponential decay function. That gives us a decay constant. And we're trying to understand how the relationship between that decay constant and the time involved in the reaction works. And we can see that now we need a time longer than 10 hours for this thing to be in steady state. So it's never in steady state. Yeah? So we can treat O singlet D as steady state, but we can't treat the ground state oxygen in steady state. I'll leave you to do the sums. Oops. We dealt with lifetimes. You dealt with lifetimes last week? Yeah? You've seen all this already. We know that the lifetime is equal to the production over the loss terms. So in the steady state conditions, the production equals the loss, if we add up all the sources and sinks. And we can draw an analogy with the reservoir. I think seem to remember two years ago, I was in Nanjing talking to you about exactly this, for those that have got a good enough memory. And I was talking about turning taps on a bath on, and, to, and taking the plug out, and we can turn, tweak the rate of flow out at the tap to match what's going out of the hole in the bath, and the level stays exactly the same. And we've got a steady state because our sources equal our sinks. That's exactly what we've got here again. Yeah? And tau, our lifetime for that reaction, in our reservoir, is simply the amount of water we've got in the bath divided by the amount going in or the amount going out. Right? And we can do that because either there might be a tiny, tiny bit of water in the bottom of the bath and we've got the tap on full and a big hole in the bottom. 
and those two match. So we've always got the same amount of a dribble of water in the bottom of the bath. But any molecule in the bath doesn't spend very long there. It gets through that system quickly. Equally, we could have a very full bath, a very small hole in our plug at the bottom of the bath, and only a little dribble of water going in. The lifetime of the water in the bath would then be very long. But we're still in steady state. Okay? And I think Gordon used the example of sulfur compounds, did he? Last week? Or not? Maybe he didn't. I'll leave that example with you because we're running out of time. So, the last thing for two first order loss processes with two rate constants, we can add them up. We add the rates together. So when we add the total rates together to get the total rate, we must add one over the lifetimes together to get one over the total lifetime. Okay? Right. Is that a summary of where you were up to? Good. Any questions? No? Nope. That's either amazingly clear or I've confused you all completely and you're too baffled to ask anything. What we're going to do now is move on to stratospheric chemistry. And I'm going to try to use some of the chemistry of the stratosphere to illustrate some of the basic photochemistry and kinetics that we just talked about. Before I start, I'm mindful we've got about 25 minutes to the break. I don't know what Gordon normally does. What do you want me to do? I can do one of two things. I can break for 10 minutes at about 10 to, and then we can do another 50 minutes. Or I can carry on all the way through for an hour and 40 minutes and stop at whatever, half past. No, 22. It's up to you. Do you, want, do you normally have a break? You normally go for an hour and four. He punishes you. He punishes you into the floor. Which would, would you like a break or not? No, you want a blast song. All right, okay, we'll do that. Suits me? I don't mind. Okay, so, stratospheric chemistry. The key molecule that we're going to be thinking about here is ozone. Ozone is absolutely crucial in the atmosphere. And the reason it's crucial is because it absorbs almost all the radiation between 220 and 300 nanometers and stops it getting from the top of the atmosphere to the surface. If we were exposed to radiation at 220, 230, 240 nanometers, we would be dead. That radiation would be harmful. It, chemi it will chemically change skin. Okay? We, we just couldn't live at the surface. We'd be digging holes and hiding underground. That's why it's important. It also is responsible for, being, for providing the temperature inversion in the stratosphere. And this is quite crucial. It provides the temperature structure of the upper atmosphere. So we need to understand, to understand all of that exchange, we need to understand the chemical behaviour of ozone. Some of the facts, it was discovered by Schoenbein in 1840. And it was, it was a gas with a peculiar smell. Ozine is, is Greek for smell. That's where the name comes from. And I don't know, if you guys, they don't do it anymore. They, they kind of have, um, have stopped. They put better filters on photocopy machines. Has anybody spent a long time on a photocopy machine? And, and you smell a kind of, it's a very clean, clear smell. It's almost like you're, you're, somebody's... Somebody cleaned your nose while you're, you're there doing the photocopying. 
and, and sometimes you can get a dry mouth, dry, the dry, it becomes dry on the back of your throat. Has anybody ever felt that? Maybe, I mean, it, modern photocopies are much better than the old ones. But because there's a UV light in a, in a photocopier, it makes ozone. And that's, that's what gives you that clean, clean smell, and it gives you a little bit of a metally taste in your mouth, and it dries your mouth down. It's very bad for you, so it's a good job those filters are in place. Um, two French guys, Fabry and Buisson, used UV measurements, and they showed that oh, the ozone column will brought down to the Earth's surface at standard pressure and temperature, the layer will be three millimeters thick. And you remember me showing you the absorption cross section of the, in the Huggins bands, there was a big zigzag as a function of wavelength. Yeah? And by measuring at two different wavelengths where you've got a dip and where you've got a peak, then you can determine how much ozone is in the column if you know what that absorption cross section is, and that's what they did. Fabry was the same guy that Fabry Peroetalon, for those that have done any physics and looked at Fabry Peroetalon before. Uh, a British chemist, Dobson, uh, invented a spectrometer for ozone measurements, and that's still in widespread use today. And it's, it's that instrument that, that measured the ozone hole for the first time. Column ozone measurements are measured in things called the Dobson unit. Uh, and one Dobson unit is the thickness in hundredths of millimetres, so 10 to the minus 5 metres, the atmospheric ozone would occupy if it was brought all the way down through the column so that you ended up with neat ozone at atmospheric pressure and temperature at the surface. It's a monumentally stupid unit, but nevertheless, that's the unit that's used. Okay? So if you can imagine collecting all the ozone molecules in the column, bringing them all the way down to the surface, displacing all of the nitrogen and oxygen that's there, and filling it with neat ozone at standard temperature and pressure, then the Dobson unit is the thickness of that layer measured in hundredths of millimetres. And typically, the layer is three millimetres thick. That's what Fabry and Wisson show. So the Dobson unit ranges typically from 290 to 310 Dobson units. We need to think about the Chapman cycle. Next. So Chapman, there was a real problem. When Dobson made designed the, um, the spectrophotometer, you could now measure ozone in the column. People knew that there wasn't ozone at the surface, so the ozone must be up there. And by 1930, people had travelled throughout most of the lower part of the troposphere and knew that ozone wasn't at the surface, it must be in the stratosphere. And people had launched balloons through the stratosphere, so they knew the stratosphere existed, and they knew the temperature structure. So people knew that the temperature must increase in the stratosphere. So there must be a reason for this. So they start, Chapman put all of this together and proposed a set of reactions that could explain the temperature structure of the stratosphere. And that's what this is it is doing here. So the absorption cross sections are on the top. I showed you before the ozone absorption cross sections, didn't I? So I showed you the Hartley band and the Huggins band, and that's what you've got here between 200 and 325 nanometers in the UV. And you've also got another absorption. This is oxygen, molecular oxygen, less than 240 nanometers. This little lower curve on the left. Now, <coughs> this bottom curve shows you the incoming intensity of radiation at different heights in the atmosphere. So that top wiggly curve that goes from about 10 to the minus 6 
out to about 10 to the minus 4 across the same wavelength frame is the incident, the intensity of the incident radiation at the top of the atmosphere. Okay? By the time you've got to 30 kilometers, you've got a great big hole in the amount of radiation. There's no radiation between 230 and 270 nanometers transmitted through the column 230 kilometers. It's gone. You do have some radiation below 230 nanometers and you do have some radiation above 275. By the time you get to the surface though, and this is a very good job, none of this deep UV has got to the surface. The only transmission is above 290 nanometers. This curve here. And even that's pretty bad for us. We get sunburn, right? If we go out in the summer, spend too long there, you get sunburn. That's because of incident photolytic reaction, the organic molecules, due to incoming UV radiation, burns you. Chemically changes your skin. Okay? If we had radiation down here, ugh, you'd be going out in a suit. Okay? Much like people do on the moon, the reason people, you know, one of the reasons people are in shiny suits is because you don't want radiation burn, which will be pretty intense when you don't have an atmosphere. Now, these reductions in radiation occur because of the absorption in the stratosphere due to ozone and oxygen. And the absorption cross-sections are there. So you can see the big red line going from 325, where those Huggins bands start, all the way through the Hartley band, down to around about 220, when it tails away. And the oxygen band extends down to beyond 200, so that's absorbing all the way down. So you've got a doodle like this, and this is just a, a little doodle just to keep us amused. So what's happening is, just as we talked about photolysis before, we've got a process where we've got oxygen molecules, we've got intense UV radiation. That UV radiation at the top of the atmosphere is absorbed by molecular oxygen in that deep band below 230 nanometers that I showed you before. That's efficient enough to break that oxygen molecule up into two atoms of oxygen. So the, the absorption cross-section is strong, but then the quantum yield is sufficiently high that we can pull that molecule apart, break that double bond. Once we've got a single oxygen atom, it will react with another, single, with, with another oxygen molecule and form ozone. And we need to describe that. So this is what Chapman did. What he said was, there are four reactions. There's an initiation reaction where we form the radical. Reaction one is the photolysis of molecular oxygen in the UV below 240 nanometers to form two oxygen atoms. Once we've got our oxygen atom, he then said, well, it reacts with molecular oxygen. But that needs a third body because the amount of energy locked in that oxygen atom is huge. So when the oxygen atom comes together with a molecule, we've got a very, very, very excited ozone and it'll just fall apart. So the only thing that's going to stop that falling apart is having a third body carrying off that energy. We've now made ozone. But ozone itself, we've already seen, can be photolyzed, can be broken down because of that great big Hartley band that we saw between 230 and 310 nanometers. So we can photolyze that molecule and we can make oxygen molecule, an oxygen molecule, and 
turn on because you're active again. So we get reaction two back. Yeah, so this is just an exchange. Nothing much is happening, we're just turning these radicals around. Reaction four and reaction five are the termination reactions. So reactions two and three are propagation. Reaction four is when we take an atomic oxygen, react it with ozone, and we form two oxygen molecules. So we've lost our radicals. And the other term termination reaction is when we've got an oxygen atom reacting with an oxygen atom and a third body to make an oxygen molecule and the third body carries away the excess energy. And that's sort of shown here. We've got a process to start that, the formation of this where we're forming our oxygen atom through reaction one, which is quite slow. Because that absorption cross-section is weak. Likewise, we've got reaction four, the combination of oxygen and ozone to form molecular and oxygen, is also slow. But the conversion processes in blue, R2 and R3, are interconverting the oxygen atom and ozone really quickly. So those, that cycle there goes on much, much faster and goes around many more times than the rates at which we're putting stuff in or taking stuff out. And it's that that forms the basis of the process of stratospheric chemistry. Now, and that's just a little doodle to show as much the same thing. I'm not going to talk about that. Before we get into the real detail, okay, and we are going to rapidly get into the detail, I'm going to wake you up soon because you're going to do something. I thought it's quite useful for me to sketch something. And we'll do, some, we'll do a physics sketch first. We're not going to do a chemistry sketch. We'll do a physics sketch, right? So our physics sketch looks like this. So this is height in the atmosphere. And this is pressure. What does that curve look like? An exponential decay. So it looks like that. Something like that. Right? If I was to plot temperature here, what does this look like? Right. So it does something like that. Yeah? That'll do for our do. Alright? Now, we're thinking about the stratosphere, so that's this bit. Okay? Let's think about these four reactions. Where are they going to go quickly and what's going to happen? Alright? So think about reaction one. Where's that going to happen quickly? It's going to happen. Well, is it? What's certainly true is the number of photons we've got up here is really high, right? Because the light from the sun's not gone through any atmosphere or anything. We've not lost any photons. So we get to the top of the atmosphere, we've still got a really high photon flux. But what don't we have? We don't have any oxygen, right? Because we've got no, the, the atmosphere is so thin, we've got no molecules. So that process could only happen really, really slowly at the top of the atmosphere. So to start with, up above the stratosphere, the reason we don't have very much is because the pressure is so low that we can't get the reaction going. As we come further into the atmosphere and we start to build up a bit of pressure, we start to get more oxygen atoms, uh, sorry, oxygen molecules. And that means we can start reaction one. 
That means we can make some odd oxygen. What about reaction two? Right, so because it's a third body reaction, we need both ozone, we both, we need, sorry, we need both molecular oxygen to be present, as we did in reaction one, but we also need the pressure to be high enough that we've got a third body to carry it away. So right at the top of the atmosphere, that won't go at all. So somewhere up here, we're going to have oxygen atoms kicking around because we've been able to get enough molecules around to get reaction one to happen but there's still very very few around to make very much ozone so only when we come further down so reaction one we make up here we can make the odd oxygen yeah and because we need a third body for reaction five, that's a very slow process to lose them again. And because we need ozone for reaction four, we can't really lose it that way either. The only other reaction in this scheme that oxygen is involved in is in reaction two. But we know that's a third body to reaction, so it doesn't happen very quickly at the top of the atmosphere. So it means once we've made these atoms up here, they'll last ages. Because no, we've got no way of getting rid of them. But when we get a bit further down, we start to get reaction two to go. So now, somewhere here, we can start to make ozone from reaction two. Yeah? Now, once we've made ozone, what happens in reaction three? We've still got loads of light, because we've not had any ozone above us to be able to destroy it. So we can react all the ozone that we've made really quickly, partly because We've got loads of uh, uh, atomic oxygen, and that means that reaction four will go really quickly. And partly because we've got loads of photons, so reaction three will go really quickly. So we'll lose ozone quickly. So we won't see much buildup of ozone, but our production rate of ozone goes up. Now, in that conversion of reactions two and three, both of those are exothermic. What does that mean? Do you know what an exothermic reaction is? It gives off heat. So there's internal energy in the molecules and when we combine them together, we release that energy. Okay? So we're releasing energy in reactions two and three. <coughs> okay? So, when we're here and we're starting to get this reaction cycle of reactions two and three going, why do you think I've drawn it there?
have drawn it at that height because the temperature is now increasing. That temperature is going up because of those two reactions causing that heat. Okay? So we get an increase in temperature in this part of the atmosphere because we're turning these reactions over. The maximum rate at which we get conversion between reactions two and three and back again is here. We're generating that heat most efficiently at that altitude. As soon as we start getting below that altitude, reaction four, we've now got lots of ozone. We've now got lots of oxygen. So we're now creating a destruction of these radicals. We're making molecular oxygen. And lastly, in the bottom one, we're combining oxygen and oxygen together, and we're forming molecular oxygen. So again, we're losing radicals. So, these reactions start to kick in as we go through here, but start to dominate down here. And then we start to lose that ozone. We've now got loads of ozone up here. And that means that it's harder for our photons to get all the way through the atmosphere because they're that busy being absorbed by ozone above. So we have a reduced amount of light here compared to here. We have a greater pressure here, so we're losing our radicals by reactions four and five. So we're going to end up with a peak in ozone, something like that, just below the peak in the, in the temperature. Does that all make sense? We're now going to do some detailed chemistry. I didn't want you to lose sight of this, because this is what's going on in the atmosphere. We need to think about that, right? And think about the chemistry in the light of this. Okay? Good. So, some detailed chemistry. So, now we're trying to consider the dynamical behaviour. And we need to consider the following reactions. So, let me, this is going to be useful, so let me just write down So we've got reaction one is that, right? Reaction two is that. Reaction three is the photolysis of ozone. Is that? Reaction four is the three body reaction of odd oxygen to form molecular oxygen again. So that's the loss process, the termination reaction. And reaction five is the combination of two oxygen, sorry, that's wrong. Um, I have to get my fingers dirty because I don't have a... Yeah? So those are those five reactions. Now, if we move on, we've got different... We can, sit, we can look at, expect the different rates of these. So... Reaction R1 is equal to it's a photolysis reaction. You saw last week and we summarised this that 
the photolysis rate can just be given a J value for a known wavelength integration over a set of wavelengths and for known absorption cross, cross sections and so and, and a quantum yield, and the concentration of molecular oxygen. So it's dependent on how much of this we've got, the intensity of radiation, the absorption cross section of oxygen, and the quantum yield for that process. Okay? For reaction two, let me just check I'm using the same conventions here. It's dependent on the rate K2 of this reaction, which is a third body reaction, it's a term molecular reaction, so it's going to be quite complicated. The concentration, the amount of oxygen atoms we've got, the amount of oxygen molecules we've got, and the concentration of a third body, the pressure. Okay? Reaction three is the photolysis of ozone. And reaction four is K4, is that what they called it? Yep, times by O, the concentration of oxygen atoms and the concentration of ozone. Gordon's not included reaction five. Why do you think he's done that? For most of this, most of this column, this is unimportant. <coughs> right at the top, it's unimportant because you need a third body. Right at the bottom, it's unimportant because the amount of ozone is much greater than this. So it's only important in a very narrow band. So he's ignored it for now. So we need to understand, we need to calculate the rates of change of ozone with time and oxygen with time. So how are we going to do that? Why don't you use those expressions and try and build an equation for the ozone by dt and the O by dt? Okay. A few minutes to think about that. And by all means, talk together with your colleagues. Have a go.
got on. Happy? Good. Right. So, let's start with the rate of change of ozone with time then. What's that look like? Okay, let's move straight to the end. So we've got R2. So we've got K2. Minus, what was R3? R3 was the photolysis of ozone, was it not? Tell me if I've got these wrong. Minus R4, which is K4. Yeah. So we're forming ozone through reaction R2, through this reaction. That's the, in this scheme, that's the only place we form ozone. And we lose ozone through the photolysis in reaction 3 and through its recombination with ox the oxygen atoms in R4. What about o the rate of change of, of oxygen? Right, so we've got two... I think Gordon's used capitals, hasn't he? Yeah. Oops. So it's formed here, but you form two oxygen atoms for each photolysis. So we need a two. We lose it through R2, we get it back through R3. So we add the photolysis of ozone here. Because we're getting oxygen here, atoms, and we're losing it through R2 and R4. So that's minus K2, just the same as here. And we're losing it through K4 which is the oxygen, what have I done here? Oh. Ozone recombination. Yeah? So we've written this thing out in full. It looks pretty horrible. We can do some combining of all of that, but never mind. That's what it looks like. So we've got a fixed rate here. We saw the standard integrals that you used before, right? People are looking quizzical, but the ones that we just went through in the last lecture, these standard integrals. <coughs> just there that we use for O triplet P, yeah? Exactly the same form is true. Ah. Here, right? Because this one has nothing to do with atomic oxygen. And this can be rewritten like that. Yeah? So that then just becomes a standard integral with the same form. Yeah? And the exponential will look like this thing here. 
Right, now, Gordon asks, what are the characteristic times? Yeah, so we've got a time scale um, for the reaction two, this one, and this is crucial. And remember why we showed it was crucial earlier. Because we said that way at the top we've got oxygen and we're photolyzing it. But then we've got this sort of three-body process here that sort of stops the initial formation of ozone, slows it down. It's only when this reaction gets going does the whole process of having ozone in the stratosphere start and kick off. So understanding the rate that we form ozone through reaction two is really quite important. So that, that rate is equal to that time scale of reaction two is equal to, with respect to oxygen atoms, is equal to that over the rate. And they cancel. Okay? So it's that thing. It's 1 over K2 times O2 times M. Right? Now, given that we know that the pressure is 2.6 times 10 to 16 molecules at 273 K, so somewhere up here, about here, at that concentration, what is what is the so that's at the sort of peak point of the temperature of the in the stratosphere. That's how why Gordon's chose it. So at that height, okay, what is we know that we've been given the pressure and we've been given the rate constant. So the times the the, the, the time scale is ten seconds. Do we know how he's got there? What has he not given us? to stop us getting that number from the equation above. Right, but what, how do we, how can we get the amount of oxygen? From what he has given us. We don't need to do anything quite that complicated. We could do it that way. But what do we need, what, what do we know about the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere? Is seven two three, and the amount of M is given. Exactly. So we just multiply by the ratio, and away we go. Right. So we can get the oxygen concentration from M multiplied by the mixing ratio of oxygen in the atmosphere. We know M, and we end up with a time scale of ten seconds. So that's really short, even in the stratosphere, right? And the JO3, the photolysis is also very rapid. We can't do that here, but that's very rapid. And that means reactions two and three go incredibly quickly. So they're turning stuff over really fast. But these processes are dead slow, comparatively. So we can assume a steady state. And if we assume a steady state, what does that mean? Here, we assume a steady state for the oxygen atoms. This is zero. What else? It means that this thing, O atoms, 
are equal to How have I got there? I've given you a help. How have I got to that point? I just want to check that you can see what I'm making for. Just about. If your eyes are as bad as mine, you can still read it. Which must mean yours are much better than mine. How have I got away with this? Just cross random stuff out and set it to zero. Reaction one and four are very slow. So we've already said, because we did the time scale analysis, that reactions one and four are much, much slower than two and three. Right? And we've also said that the steady state, we can calculate a steady state for oxygen atoms because the oxygen atoms are being, in, are being converted between these two reactions really, really quickly, right? Compared to how quickly they're formed and how quickly they're lost. So on the time scales that are less than the rates of formation and loss, we can assume steady state for the oxygen atom. Right? If we then assume steady state, we can set all of this horrible nonsense to be zero. Which means that our sources must equal our sinks. Okay? I'd already get, combined these two together and brought the oxygen out the front. Which means we can then take that to the other side, or this lot to the other side, and we can divide both sides by what's in the curly brackets. And that gives us this ratio. But because we said reaction one was slow and reaction four was slow, these are small compared to these two. So the ratio is dependent solely on reactions two and three. Now, that gives us this thing, which is broadly what we've got at the top, okay? I've done that wrong. That's the easiest way of turning that round. <laughs> That's what you get to doing it all in your head in one go. Yeah, I got the ratio the wrong way around. I apologise. Okay. So we get that ratio at the top. Gordon's found the, the ratio of odd oxygen to ozone and, oh, oh, sorry, of atomic oxygen to ozone, and that's equal to the photolysis rate of ozone divided by the reaction rate of, ozone, of, 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 of reaction two the molecular concentration of oxygen and the molecular and, and, the, and the atmospheric pressure. Okay? And we said that when we look at this, we've got some curves from the literature. When all people in the 1970s, 1960s and 70s were trying to understand this, they did the, the, the kinetics in the lab to understand these reactions. And when they did that, they, you can calculate the, the, this um, oxygen atom to ozone ratio, which you can see on the graph on the left, as a function of height. And when you do that, you see that really the, the amount of oxygen atom compared to ozone is about 
1%, well, less than 1%, about 1% or less, sorry, of the amount of ozone for all altitudes less than 50 kilometers. So only above 50 kilometers does the oxygen atom start to become the dominant amount of well, actually above 60 kilometers of it become equal to the amount of ozone that's there. And you can see those simultaneous measurements over Texas also show between 28 and 42 kilometers, where the oxygen atom is really still very small. And that means that the amount of radical that's there is almost entirely ozone. So, if we do that, We, we can see that the rate of ozone production is now limited. So the amount of production is limited by the photolysis of, oxy of, of, of oxyg oxygen in the first place, the form of oxygen, and the destruction through rate 4. And we can say that because we know that this ratio is vanishingly small and the odd oxygen equates to ozone. So what we've got, in essence, is a box. We're photolyzing O2 to make odd oxygen. And we've got the odd oxygen being formed here. That's reacting to form ozone. The ozone's reacting back to form odd oxygen. And the only thing that's happening is we're spitting out. Oops. We're spitting out O2 by the combination of these two. So we can sort of draw a box around this. And we couldn't care less what happens in the box. We don't know. We don't care. We know that the combination of O and ozone for every altitude less than 50 kilometers is entirely ozone. Every time we get the odd oxygen, it goes back to ozone almost immediately. So its concentration is tiny. So if we want to explain the amount of ozone that's there, we know that our odd oxygen our OX, which is equal to, the concentration of it is equal to the concentration of O plus the concentration of ozone. And we, if we want to calculate the total amount of OX in the box, we know that this is tiny and it's nearly all this. So we don't need to worry about these two reactions because they're just telling us how these are swapping about. And we've accounted for those through the steady state ratio. So all we're left with is what's going in and what's going out. And that's what we've got in the next slide there. The formation of odd oxygen through to the photolysis of the oxygen molecule. We form two oxygen atoms, but as soon as we form them, they're forming ozone. And that ozone kicks around in this magic box until we lose it because it reacts with an odd oxygen and it, fall, it falls apart as it forms molecular, molecular oxygen. So what we can do now is we can play a few games. Because in there, we've got... Um, we've got the second expression, which is, has got, so our rate of, of loss of ozone in that first reaction has got an oxygen atom. Yeah? But we've already shown that the ozone to O ratio 
is equal to K O two M over J ozone. Yeah? So we can use that and substitute that for the oxygen atom in the top expression. Yeah. And that gives us this horrible thing underneath. But the good news is, all that has in it is the photolysis rate of O2, the photolysis rate of ozone, the ozone concentration, some rate constants, and the pressure. Now we can assume steady state. Because the diurnal variations are small, reactions 1 and 3 don't happen. And at night, R2 balances R4. So we can assume steady state. And that gives us an equation for the square of the ozone concentration. And so we can derive the final ozone concentration below. Does that make sense? Or do you want me to go through every line of that expression? I can do that. I assume this rag is either somebody's jumper or something to clean the board with. And I think it's something to clean the board with. Uh, so what can I rub off? That's this, right? And we saw how we got this. So I'm going to get rid of all of this. So, oh, I should get rid of that as well. Right, so, we've seen that the, the rate of change of ozone is equal to its formation into this box of our odd oxygen via the photolysis of the oxygen molecule. And its loss is by the recombination of ozone and the atomic oxygen through reaction 4. Yeah? But we know from this thing that oxygen equals JO3 times ozone over K2O2 because we can treat the oxygen atom as at steady state. Yeah? So we can plug that thing into here. squared this because we've got an ozone from here and we've got an ozone from here. Yeah? And that's what we've got in that second expression. Now, at night, we don't have reactions one or reactions three. We've shut those off. 
Okay? So we can't form any more odd oxygen. And we can't lose any ozone and reconvert it back to oxygen atoms. So the only thing that's got to happen at night is the conversion from oxygen atoms to ozone and the loss of oxygen atoms and ozone to form molecular oxygen in reaction four. Okay? Now we also know that diurnal variations of ozone in the stratosphere are small. Now for that to be the case, that must mean that reaction two must balance reaction four. Because if it didn't, then we'd see a change. So these two must roughly balance. Okay? So, what we can now do is play some games. So we can say that if the ozone concentration is roughly constant, what does that tell us about this equation? Zero. So it's approximately in steady state. Yeah? So if it's in steady state, what must be true? We ought to be able to balance this in photostationary steady state. That's zero. Yeah? So. That's true. Okay? And that means we can derive an expression for ozone for the ozone concentration. So the ozone concentration squared, that's that thing, is equal to JO2 times the oxygen concentration times by this thing that we're going to bring over here times K2, that means it's the square of the oxygen concentration, two of these, multiplied by F, the third body, right? Divided by K4 and J03. Okay? Does that make sense? Good. Now, I can rearrange that a bit to get us to a point when, I'll come this way, so we can say that's equal to 2, we'll keep the 2 over there, the pressure M, K2 over K4, right, so what we've got left is the square of the ozone concentration is now equal to the two doesn't matter. It's really the pressure, the ratio of the two rate constants, K2 and K4, the photolysis rate ratios of JO2, JO3, and the square of the ozone, of the oxygen concentration, molecular oxygen concentration. Now, the square of this thing happens to be equal to some fraction of the total pressure, which we just said before, yeah? 
So, so what Gordon's done is folded that into here. It's about 18%, something like that. Right? Folded that into there and take the square root of all of this lot. And that's what you've got left. Okay? So to calculate the ozone concentration in the stratosphere, okay, you've got something that doesn't depend on anything else other than the pressure, the rate constants, which is dependent on the temperature, and the photolysis rate. So those are all our physical parameters that are dictating the shape of the ozone profile through the atmosphere. So, the lifetime of ozone at midday at 15 kilometers to compared to midday at 40 kilometers. Well, I'm not going to do that for you. You can do it yourselves. But this gives you the ozone formation rates from the photolysis of O2 at various altitudes. So that tells you what the formation rates are. Okay? And you can see how great a variation there is. So the photolysis rate of oxygen, molecular oxygen, at the surface <coughs> is zero, essentially. 10 to the minus 6 molecules per centimetre squared per second, and it's in the cube per second. We don't make ozone from photolysis of molecular oxygen at the surface. Okay? We don't even make ozone at the poles way up to about 30 or 40 kilometers. We start to make ozone quite markedly at about 20 kilometers and above at low latitudes, close to the tropics. So there's a hot spot for the formation of ozone by a molecular oxygen above the equator at around about 40 kilometers. That's the maximum production rate. Now, so now I'll show you this plot. So given that I've, what I've just shown you, what's happening here? <coughs> Explain this. For all those that weren't paying attention and were busy snoring at the back or at the front, I'm not going to discriminate. We're producing hardly any ozone close to poles. And we're producing most of the ozone in the tropics. However, when I look at this, the ozone column over the tropics is what? Is that the maximum? No. The maximum column is in the high latitude. So what's going on? Sorry? Transportation. Transportation. Do we know enough about stratospheric dynamics to tell me what the transportation process is? It's a thing called the Brewer-Dobson circulation. And that's this thing. Okay? And what's happening is to do with what's happening at the surface. Okay. So if we look at the surface and look at the pole, at the equator, that's where we're putting most of the solar energy in. Okay. 
Okay? So we're heating the planet's surface at the equator. What happens is, which because we're generating that, putting that energy in, that energy is doing two things. It's heating the surface and it's evaporating water. So that water condenses into cloud. And we form these very big, very energetic storm systems at the equator that go all the way up to about 15 or 16 kilometers. Way up to a pressure of 100 millibar. That's pushing the whole atmospheric column up. And that's got to go somewhere. It can't just keep going up and up and up and end up in space. If you try and push a liquid up in the middle of a pan by putting some heat in, in the bottom of the pan, it doesn't all come up in a column and go everywhere, does it? So what do you, you set up a circulation in that pan. That's exactly what you've got here. Because you've got cooler air at the pole, you've got warmer air at the equator, that air at the equator lifts, that causes a low pressure at the surface, you get inflow of air from the pole to the equator at the surface, and you get lifting up through the column, and then you get a large scale motion going from the equator out towards the pole, and then subsidence back down again. And it's that process that carries the ozone in the stratosphere from where it's made in the equator out towards the pole. Okay, so you see the lowest concentration above the equator, but it's the biggest production rate. So most of it's formed there, but it's moved away. And you see the maximum concentrations actually around about the mid latitudes, mid to high latitudes. So here you actually see the concentrations um, slightly dipping in the southern hemisphere and slightly dipping at the northern hemisphere too, though you can't quite see them as much. So this is what you've got. Now I'm going to about finish here. You end up with, because this is where I'll, I'll leave Gordon to do the exciting bit of stratospheric chemistry, chemistry, because I've now taken you through the Chapman cycle. We've used all of that basic photochemistry that we started with the week before for a couple of weeks ago, right? And I hope you've seen that we've tried to use it again in the same way this week to try and understand the behaviour of all of this. Okay? And it's helped us to understand, just like it helped Sidney Chapman understand and explain stratospheric photo, that's exactly what we've done. Precisely what he did by using the only thing that he had to do that we've not had to do this afternoon is go into the laboratory and calculate the rate constants K2 and K4. He had to find them experimentally. We've got them in a book. But he, he had to go away and measure. Right? But that's what he did. And he put them in his model. And he calculated profiles. And this looked really good. He could explain all of this stuff. But then people start going out and making measurements all over the globe. And they said, well, hang on a minute, Sydney, because that was his first name, Sydney Chapman. You've got it wrong. And so the, the solid curves that you can see there are the calculated curves at the equator and at 30 north. All right? They're calculated using the Chapman cycle, using the Chapman profile. Okay? And he gets this maximum in ozone concentration, and then he gets the tail away. Right? And he gets the ozone concentration at 10 to 12 molecules below. Now, people went out and launched balloons all over the world and measured ozone. They, they worked out how to make a measurement of ozone in a very light and very easy to use thing that you could put on a balloon and launch and send away into the atmosphere and radio back to the surface. And these things were, weren't common until the 1970s or so. But you can see here that the observed profile, which is over Panama, which is 9 north, okay? 
So somewhere between the equator and 30 north, so it should be between those two lines, appears way down here. Two things are wrong. First thing is, it's about only about half the concentration that it should be. And secondly, the peak is in the wrong place. Shift of light. Well, this is a bit of a screw up. So everything I just told you for the previous hour, well, it's not wrong, but it's not the answer either. We need more information. Essentially, we've got a missing thing here. We're not producing enough. We actually, or the other alternative is we've got too fast a loss. So the point here is, we've got, in this scheme, we've got somehow we are losing a lot of oxygen. We know how we produce it from, JNO, uh, from JO2. And we also know about the pulsatis rate of ozone. We've measured those. And we can't think of another way of making ozone or losing ozone. But the loss of odd oxygen seems to be faster than the Chapman mechanism predicts. And the reason for that is because of radical removal by HOX, by NOX, and by halogens. Okay? This is the work that led to the Nobel Prize for Stratospheric Chemistry in the 1990s as a result of work in the 70s. I'm going to stop now, and Gordon will pick up that story next, next time, two weeks' time. All right? Any questions? I can answer them now or later, or Gordon can when he's back. Hope that was clear. Good to see you all again. Yep, sure. I had a feeling you were going to. I was going to speak to you. Uh, I, uh, this is the auto experiment last week. Yep. And this, he beat you. And this is the pyrosol in universal place. Yep. And this is in Simon cluster. And I did, as you said, I did a car calibration at the start and at the end. And uh, here's the uh, calibration. What do you mean by calibration? Do you mean a calibration? A uh, filter. You did zero? Yeah. Right, okay. And uh, here... No, that's fine. That's, that's fine. I, I just... Yep. And uh, here is the background. Yeah. I turn the amplifier on, off, on, off, on, off. And uh, I think there is a natural decaying trend. On. Which one's on and which one's off? Uh, background. On, off, on, off, on, off. But that's the trend that you've got anyway. Yeah. This is the whole experiment, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so what you're really telling me... Yeah. What you're really telling me is these, these periods here yeah. are really, if you were to colour this, this by the colours that you've got here, you would just colour these different periods. Yeah. And this is the background yeah. at the start. Yeah. What do you mean by background at the start? I don't understand. Uh, effectively turn the air off. off. Right. So, 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 so there's a zero here. Then this is background, yeah. or some chunk of that, yeah. and then this is with the purifier. Uh, then the purifier. Oh, then you go to this one, yeah. which okay. is the purifier on, which yeah. is probably that. Yeah. Yeah, ish maybe, yeah. and then I turn it off, off. you turn it off again, and that's probably that little step. Yeah. Uh, 
Lost really? Ooh. I've no idea. Sorry, I'm I'm no help. I'm not from this building. There I think if you go to the top of the stairs, I think there's a So so essentially what you've got I think you could do with presenting this a little bit better. Yeah. But nevertheless, what it shows is you've got good zeros. Yeah. Yeah. You are measuring NO2 in the room. Uh, yeah. I mean, good zeros are like zero point. Well, you've got good zeros. I mean, I offset uh, uh, the average of these two periods, like minus 0 0.4, and I plus all the data. I mean, the original data looks like this, 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 and I. Well, show the original data. Yeah. Right? And then show what you've done. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I mean, I can't see. Write up what you've done in yeah. a report yeah. to send to Richard. Yeah. Send it to me before you send it to Richard. Okay. Okay? So we will look at it and then we will send it to Richard. Okay. Because I, I want you to put some in, to include some stuff. We're not going to send it out to anybody. Okay. He can have it for what it is. Yeah. 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 And decide what to do. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, to me, I mean, there's only two explanations of this. Either the instrument isn't working, either the device isn't working, well, either the device is rubbish, yeah. or the device is not working. I got two devices. Uh, these are the second air purifier, and uh, this blue one are the first air purifier. Okay. Well, I mean, I assume you know how to use these devices. I, I, I'm not saying you don't. Yeah. I am just saying that assuming that you are operating these devices correctly, yeah. okay, yeah. then you have two devices and neither device appears to be making yeah. a considerable difference to the ambient concentration in the room at these levels. Yeah, I think so. And do you want to look into the other data? So what's the next job? And uh, this is from yesterday, the university place, a ground floor reception desk. Okay. And uh, Where, a university place? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is the background. And I turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off. And uh, here is where a fire alarm occurs, like all people evacuated from the building. And uh, here is the cluster analysis. Like so, 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 hang on. So, so this appears to show. There's no background at the end, right? Uh, there's a bug with the instrument software. I got the older version, like the background uh, was in my measurements. So, so, so let me just get this right. I mean, this is again why you have to annotate this properly because it's, I'm finding this difficult to read, never yeah. mind anybody else. So this is the 30 minute background here. Yeah. Yeah. And then you uh, like 50 minutes. went to the exit of the purifier which is yeah. somewhere in here. Yeah. And then you turn the purifier off. Yeah. But you didn't do any you didn't do any backgrounds again in the middle. Uh, other than the purifier off. You mean moving the inlet 
Yeah. Well, I, I mean, what you're really saying, yeah. this is a bit unfortunate, because your 30-minute background appears to coincide with lunchtime. Yeah. So there are loads of people in the building. Is yeah. that true? Yeah. And then subsequently in the afternoon, there were fewer people in the building. When was this? Yesterday? Yeah, yes. So this is Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Which is, so, it, because it's Wednesday, there would have been rather few people going through University Place, right? Yeah, there was a big, uh, big bunch of stu uh, school children yeah. in upstairs. But this doesn't show any effect of the purifier. This is just yeah. stuff going up and down, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Next. Uh, do you want to look into the... Uh, basically the same trend? Like well, this is just looking at the cluster analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is kind of just basically the same trend. 